Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 727 of the podcast and it is Friday the 8th of December 2023 as I record this. Today's show is a solo episode and I'm talking about how generative AI search will impact book discoverability in the next decade. So how will changes to the way people search impact book discoverability? What can authors and publishers do to ensure their books are found in the new form of generative AI search? While it is still early days for this technology, I share my thoughts in this episode with the hope, as ever, that we can surf the wave of change rather than drown in it. And this is a topic I have been thinking about for over a year now. I just haven't been able to put it together in a coherent way. (laughs) But now I really feel like the time is necessary to start thinking about this in a big way. So that's coming up in the usual interview section. So in publishing and book marketing things. On the Wish I'd Known Then podcast this week, Helen Schurer talks about launching a series and includes uh, ARCs, so advanced reader copies, pre-orders, the mindset of launches, dealing with a disappointing launch and common mistakes that authors make when launching a series. And I know this is a topic that uh, many people, it is really important, like (laughs) doing some kind of launch. And I'm now circling back to this as more important because of the Kickstarters. So I kind of gave up on launches for a good number of years because, you know, I just put books out there, sent a few emails, put a few ads on and that was it. But now with uh, going back to Kickstarter, I am definitely doing a lot more serious things around launches. So that is on the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. Also on the Rebel Author podcast this week, or last week as this goes out, Sasha Black interviews Adam Beswick about selling direct, particularly on TikTok shop. Now, Adam does really well on TikTok and TikTok is now social commerce rather than just social media. And it is designed to keep people on the platform and sell to them. I don't use it. And I am not intending to use it, but I realise that a lot of people do use it and want to be better at it. So I thought that I would mention this interview because it does overlap with Selling Direct, which, as you know, is one of my things. And, uh, you know, if, if I was into TikTok, I would be using TikTok Shop. So that's on the Rebel Author podcast. But of course, you don't have to use it. I don't. So it's one of those choices for you to make as an author. Um, But yeah, have a listen to that if you are interested. Also, BookBub put out their best BookBub ads of 2023. So even if you don't use BookBub pay-per-click ads, uh, which I do when I run certain campaigns sometimes, but it is interesting how simple some of the ads are. So it's actually worth looking at just to see where you're attracted to, like what really draws your eye and how much the words on very simple images made me want to click, sometimes more than the book cover. So one example was, Lisbeth Salander is back. That was the words on it. Now, I couldn't even tell you the name of the book or the new author, because I do know that Stieg Larsson, the original uh, inventor, uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo, she's the character from that. She is a very strong character. So I know her as a character name more than I care about the name of the book, for example. Or, you know, I can tell you about Jack Reacher as a character. I cannot tell you possibly even a single book title from Lee Child, but I do know the name of the character. So there you go. Uh, The tagline on a couple of the books also is interesting. Uh, One of them was love, 
Lovecraft and Mr. Darcy. That is the title of it, but it, by Violet King, I should say. So this is an actual book, Love, Lovecraft and Mr. Darcy. Now, I live in Bath and I particularly hate Jane Austen because we get these Jane Austen parades and there's just too many bonnets for my liking. And uh, But pairing this with Lovecraft made me interested enough to want to click that and have a look. Also, there was a Chirp audiobook bundle that was interesting because of the price drop. And I'm doing audiobook bundles on my Shopify stores and they sell really well. So doing audiobook bundles, because they're normally much higher priced than ebook bundles. So that is really interesting too. So yes, have a look at that. That's on the uh, BookBub blog. Links in the show notes. Also, Written Word Media put out their survey results this week on the state of indie authorship. Now, obviously, this is a survey based on Written Word Media's audience, um, but they had a good number of authors reply. It goes through the number, the types of books published, how many are published, editing and cover design practices, lots of details about genre, marketing and more. So it's worth checking it out in more detail. There was also a question about AI in this survey. 46% said they would use AI for marketing. So that's, you know, a good number. Whereas over 70% said they would never use AI for writing actual words. And I think this is the general consensus of of how I see people getting into AI is they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to use it for, for marketing or for writing things that are not particularly personal to me. But most authors are still wouldn't use it for writing actual words. And don't worry, you don't have to use it for that. You can use it for all the stuff you find difficult or that you don't like particularly doing. For example, coming up with ad copy <laughs> for ads or other things. So yeah, I think that's interesting. Marketing is definitely the way in to using AI tools for sure. 85% of authors surveyed had their own website and 27% of those sell direct from that site. So I think that's an interesting beginning. I do think that many people who are focusing on selling direct are uh, also non-fiction authors and written word media is, you know, has a lot more fiction authors than non-fiction. Over 42% of authors surveyed had published an audiobook. And perhaps that trend will now go up. So I'll be interested in what that is next year, since the big news this week is... Authors can now distribute Google Play Books auto-narrated audiobooks with Find Away Voices by Spotify. So basically, Google Play Books has had AI narration for, you know, a good couple of years now. And uh, now you can distribute that through Find Away Voices to a whole load of retailers, obviously, including Spotify. So from their blog post, which I'll link in the show notes, Find Away Voices by Spotify has begun accepting digital voice narrated audiobooks from Google Play Books for distribution to select retail partners. So that's not everywhere. That is not too audible at the moment, but there's quite a few that it is included and I imagine that will grow next year. Google Play Books currently offers auto-narrated audiobook creation and editing for existing ebooks at no charge to the author. Yes, it is free to create auto-narrated audiobooks. It's interesting they don't use the word AI, but this is basically AI narration. Back to the blog post, we are also implementing metadata practices to denote this type of content in the narration credit. The book description will be (laughs) prepended... It's like, why not just use start? (laughs) The book description will start with the first sentence stating, this audiobook is narrated by a digital voice. This will appear on all listening platforms where the audiobook is distributed. And this is what I've always said is be very obvious with your AI narration or your use of AI. Um, And again, I don't have any issue with this. I think we should be educating people on things. Either people want to listen or they don't. That's up to them. So you can listen to a whole episode on how to use Google Play Books auto narration with Ryan Dingler from Google, which we did here on the show in August 2022, back in episode 642. So if you're listening on the audio feed, you should just be able to use the search to go back to that episode. Um, So that might be interesting if you haven't done this already. So, of course, I mostly narrate my own human voice audiobooks for nonfiction and my short stories, but I have made a few AI narrated audiobooks to try out the technology. And I do have a couple with Google Play Audio, but I do primarily 
advertise and promote my own human voice. I also have hired human narrators. But I do know some authors have done their entire back catalogue with Google Play auto narration. Because it is free to produce an audiobook that way, you can sell them direct. And now you can put them on Findaway. So I imagine this weekend, a whole load of people just uploading books to Findaway and distributing them. I think this is a huge move by Spotify. It's going to dramatically increase the number of audiobooks on their platform. And as I talk about later in the main part of the body of the episode, Spotify is using Google for other things as well, including their search stuff. So I think this is a really, really significant. I mean, when Spotify bought Findaway, I thought at the time, yeah, and they also own an AI voice company themselves. This is really an interesting move. So although Audible, you know, you can distribute to Audible through Findaway, but not the AI narration, but Audible is allowing AI narration through Amazon KDP's beta invite only, US only program. So I'm not in that, obviously, I'm not in the US. I think it's also mainly KU authors who are being invited into that. I would expect, though, that 2024 will see all the audio services accepting AI narrated audio. The main question is, what files from what services? Because, of course, many indie authors use Eleven Labs, which has better and more diverse and different choices of voices and accents, like a ton of them. But I presume that Findaway is part, well, Spotify is partnering with Google because they can be sure of the legalities behind the training data for the voices and the scalability of it over time. If you imagine the size of the legal department at Google <laughs> compared to Eleven Labs, that will tell you a bit about it. But their help desk for now, Findaway Ways help desk and I did email them to check. They said only Google Play Audio can be used. So yeah, I mean, hopefully I do know people who are sort of asking Eleven Labs to go to Google and go to Spotify and try and change that. So personally, I'm holding off creating any more AI narrated audio for now. I continue to focus on narrating my own books, but I do have, um, I, I was thinking about doing this for Catacomb, which is a male voice. And uh, I think I'm going to wait and see how this shakes out before doing that. So we shall see. So in personal news, and in fact, in human audiobook narration news, I have finally narrated A Midwinter Sacrifice, which is a short story inspired by the Christmas markets here in Bath, which I wrote uh, first. I wrote it first in 2015 and didn't publish it and rewrote it. And it kind of comes and goes. But every year and I published the ebook a couple of years ago, but I haven't narrated the audiobook because I'm like, I put it off and put it off. And then it's not Christmas. And I just think, oh, I can't be bothered. But this year I have managed it. It is out. You can get it on jfpenbooks.com if you would like to hear me read you a dark Christmas story. It doesn't have a happy ending, just so you know. Um, I'm one of those people who walk around the Christmas markets and just see darkness everywhere. Uh, It should also be in your usual audio apps. So that is A Midwinter Sacrifice by JF Penn. And uh, it's also available on ebook. You can get it on my store and at jfpenbooks.com. Also, Beneath the Zoo is out, at least on my store. It's on pre-order elsewhere. Just in the ebook, I will do the audio in the next few weeks. But this short story has been on my mind while I when I it sort of came back to me when I started uh, writing the shadow about sort of divorce and family and it's inspired by Bristol Zoo which is a city near me and where I used to go with my dad and my brother in the early days after my parents divorced and it has closed and it's being demolished to build houses and so for the story the architect has a history with the zoo and her father and discovers a terrible secret beneath the zoo. (laughs) I'm really glad to have it done and out of my head because I can't work on more than one fiction project at a time like properly and now I this week I actually did have uh, a good whole day 
I needed a day off. And so <laughs> Jonathan laughed at me because I spent a whole day researching Arcane 13, um, really getting into the bit I love about writing books, about fiction, which is reading all kinds of weird, obscure stuff and figuring out a story that could have its basis in fact, which is kind of what my Arcane series is. It's like 95% true. And then it just goes into something strange. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also planning a research trip to Vienna, Nuremberg and Cologne at the end of uh, January. So, of course, Vienna is in Austria, Nuremberg and Cologne are in Germany. And uh, both Vienna and Cologne have gorgeous Gothic cathedrals. So it's kind of an input trip for both Arcane 13 and also my Gothic cathedral book. So that is very useful. Also, as this goes out, I will have finished the final live shadow session webinars. So this is kind of my final notice on the Kickstarter fulfillment, which is almost complete. You should have everything now, although I have noticed uh, with the tracking that some of the gold hardbacks are still in the slower than usual Christmas post to some countries. But uh, you hopefully will have everything. You should certainly have had the digital books for uh, and the audio and the ebook and the digital workbook for a month already. So um, those with consulting sessions, please email me if we haven't already been in touch. Any issues, email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. And hopefully that's it now with that Kickstarter project, getting all the fulfillment done. Writing the Shadow is now out on my store, creativepenbooks.com. In the normal formats, there is no gold foil format that was Kickstarter only. And it's also on pre-order at other stores for the end of the year. And my first speaking event is coming up in early February. I'll be speaking at the History Quill online conference. They have two days. It's all online. Very good conference. And I say it's very good. Very high quality production and sessions. So they have day one is craft, day two is business. You can buy a ticket for just one of the days. So even if you don't write historical fiction, uh, then you might still like the day two on business, which is kind of for everyone. I am speaking on writing and publishing in the age of AI, which, and I've already told them, I can't get my slides in weeks early because it literally changes up to the minute. I mean, even what I recorded I recorded today's show yesterday, so Thursday, the 7th of December. And even by the end of the day, there had been more things that I could have added, but I, I haven't done. But it changes so fast at the moment. But yes, I'm speaking on writing and publishing in the age of AI. Um, that is the History Quill Conference. You can use my affiliate link at thecreativepen.com forward slash history 24. So thecreativepen.com forward slash history 24. Links in the show notes. So thanks for your emails and comments this week. Mary Claire Allington says, thanks, I really enjoyed the episode with Jane Dixon-Smith, especially about the layout and the photos. Some of my get projects get pushed away from me because I want more visuals and it seems too much at the moment. But hopefully, Mary Claire, you can actually get into that next year. Also, J. Dawn King said, what a terrific podcast. Jane also does my covers and her cookbook is lovely with great recipes. And also thanks to Guy Windsor, who sent me a lovely photo of him listening to Writing the Shadow in Lisbon in Portugal, which is a fantastic city and in fact was the inspiration for another of my books, Tree of Life. So yes, always lovely to see pictures of where you're listening to the podcast or my audiobooks. And you can send me a message by leaving a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or the YouTube channel or email me. Send me pictures of where you're listening, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen who fund my brain and thinking time on these more expansive futurist topics. 
As a patron, you get access to the monthly Q&A, which is essentially an extra solo show every month, as well as videos on behind the scenes on AI tools. And I'll be sharing more in 2024. I've got a sort of a plan coming. I'll be sharing more videos. I'll be doing more behind the scenes stuff about business. So it's not just about AI. It's about mindset, author business. And I'm turning my Patreon hub into a really useful resource for authors. I've got one, a new video coming in the next week or so, my end to end process for Beneath the Zoo and how I use various tools, including the cover. If you've seen the cover, it is awesome. And I did that with Dali. And uh, it really is blew my mind, actually. (laughs) So the Patreon is now a monthly subscription, the equivalent of buying me a black coffee a month or a couple of flat whites if you're feeling generous. So if you feel you get value from the show and you want more, come on over and join more than 800 authors uh, behind the scenes. Thanks to all patrons who've been supporting the show for years and months. You are amazing. And thanks to new patrons this week, Julie, Ghent, Tara, Ashley, Peter, Windward Group and Gail, Tammy, Brent, Tracy, Gihan, Nikki, Renee, Douglas, Krista, Jay, Terrell, David and Lisa. Yes, we have lots of people coming in every week and I love our conversations uh, behind the scene. You can join the community and receive lots of extra information and inspiration as well as supporting the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the epic solo episode. But first off, thanks to Orna Ross for reading in advance and also to Jay Thorne who commented on the draft to make sure I wasn't off track. Jay reports on weekly AI news for creatives at creativeaidigest.com, which is a free weekly email for all things AI for creatives. Right, let's get into it. How Generative AI Search Will Impact Book Discoverability in the Next Decade Introduction Book discovery is going to change over the next decade, and in this podcast episode, I share my thoughts on how it might shape out so we can prepare and make sure our books can be found in an ever-growing sea of content. I've been using Google Bard and Microsoft Bing, both generative search engines, in the last few months to see how things might play out. I also increasingly use ChatGPT as a search and discovery tool, both through text and voice, and I used all three services as part of preparing this article. And there are screenshots and links and everything in the show notes at thecreativepen.com. In terms of my personal experience, I've been interested in AI for creatives since AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol at the ancient Chinese game of Go in 2016, and I've been sharing interviews and resources here ever since. I've been experimenting with ChatGPT since it launched in November 2022, as well as using Midjourney, Dali, Claude, Pseudowrite and other tools and I set out my personal position in The AI-Assisted Artisan Author, previous episode from earlier this year. I should also say, this is actual real Joe. <laughs> this is not voice AI. Uh, until I tell you otherwise, The uh, my voice is real human Joe. <laughs> so this is me. Uh, although I am reading this, I've pre- obviously prepared this well in advance, but I'll probably go off piste sometimes. The article itself is just the text. So if you want to read it, pop on over to the website. As I've used the various tools, my search behaviour has changed. And I've also monitored news and opinion pieces on this topic from others. We are the early adopters for sure. And most people are not even aware of how these AI tools can be used. But it's clear from the speed of development that the platforms themselves are going to drive the change. And once the most powerful search engines incorporate generative AI, adoption will happen more quickly. We need to be ready for this change. Note, this will not cover aspects of copyright or legal or ethical concerns around generative AI. I've covered these in other articles and interviews and in my book on AI. You can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash future to find all of that. So how does search work now? 
For the last two decades, we have used various search engines to type in a couple of words or a question and then hit enter. This search process works the same whether you search on Google, YouTube, Amazon, Instagram, Spotify or any other search engine. And over the years, we've learned the best way to phrase our searches to get the best results. The search engine lists pages of links related to the query, and we usually go into the first couple to see if they have what we want. If they match our query, we stay on the site. We read or listen or watch. Maybe we buy a book or a product or service or sign up to an email list. We become part of the ecosystem of wherever we have landed. If we don't like what the search engine serves up, we go back, modify our keywords to be more clear about our intention and try again. The search engine sends traffic, either organically or through pay-per-click ads, which are placed on popular keywords and keyword phrases. An entire industry has grown up around search engine optimization and advertising for the various sites we all use, including services for authors like Publisher Rocket, which many indie authors use for Amazon keywords. Most of us don't usually use particularly complicated searches, and we are used to thinking in basic keyword phrases. For example, how to self-publish a book, or novels about stone carving. The latter is actually one of my searches, as I have a story brewing about a stonemason. And part of my research process is usually to order 10 to 15 books on a topic and read them as my ideas percolate. I did this search, novels about stone carving, on amazon.co.uk and google.com to demonstrate the results I get at the moment. And as I mentioned, there are screenshots in the show notes and the transcript of this episode at thecreativepen.com. Just go to the blog or the podcast and uh, check this out but I'm also going to talk about it, so you don't need to go and look at the pictures. I used the Amazon book category to search, and it returned. The first section is an ad about vibrant decorative stones for your garden. Clearly not relevant. The next three are books, art of letter carving in stone, ancient British rock art, and the forest woodworker. Again, none of these are relevant to my search. There has been much discussion about how Amazon's search algorithm is polluted by so many ads that it's increasingly hard to find what you might enjoy. And many now use different ways to find books to read, including me. I use mainly ChatGPT these days. Google's response to this search is actually a lot better, with book covers that relate to stone, including some novels, which all link back to Amazon and Goodreads. The top section is again based on ads, but they are all for relevant books, so I don't really mind. I actually clicked through to some and I bought Lapidarium, The Secret Lives of Stones, (laughs) The Joys of Book Research. So how does generative search work? Generative search is different in several key ways. First, it is a back and forth conversation. So the search becomes more granular with every response, uncovering deeper aspects of the user intent and also what they really mean. Second, it may provide a complete answer to a question, not just a list of links, although this is more likely if there is no buyer intent. As Fortune magazine reported in October 2023, as the quality of AI-generated answers improve, users will have less incentive to browse through search result listings. They can save time and effort by reading the AI-generated response to their query. All the biggest search engines have already adopted or are experimenting with this approach. I had this discussion with Google Bard about uh, generative search and it explained. Generative search employs AI algorithms to process the nuances of natural language queries, extracting meaning and context to deliver insightful and tailored responses. This intelligent approach goes beyond simply providing links. It attempts to answer user questions directly, 
providing summaries, explanations, and even creative text formats like poems, scripts, and musical pieces. Generative search algorithms can analyse user behaviour, search history, and preferences to tailor search results to an individual's interests. When a reader searches for a book related to a genre or theme they enjoy, generative search can prioritise results that match their taste, increasing the likelihood of them discovering books by specific authors. Generative search can also go beyond simply providing search results. It can actively recommend books to readers based on their past reading habits and preferences. This personalised approach can introduce readers to new authors and genres they might not have encountered otherwise, potentially leading to increased sales for those authors. I asked ChatGPT, and I always ask it to include metaphors. Uh, This is what ChatGPT said. Think of it as a wise sage that learns from each interaction, continually refining its understanding of what the user seeks. It doesn't just respond to direct queries, but anticipates needs based on a mosaic of data. Past searches, user preferences, and even subtle patterns in browsing behaviour. It interprets the intent and context behind a search, offering results that are not just relevant, but also insightful and often surprising. It's the difference between asking for directions and being guided on a journey. ChatGPT goes on. Generative search, unlike its predecessor, the traditional search engine, doesn't just find paths, it creates them. It's akin to having a compass that doesn't point north, but instead points directly to what you seek, often before you even know you're seeking it. This new form of search technology uses sophisticated algorithms and AI to understand and predict the nuanced desires of readers – offering them a tailor-made treasure trove of books that they are likely to cherish. Sounds pretty good, right? (laughs) So it's worth experimenting with Google Bard at bard.google.com and Microsoft Bing Chat, bing.com forward slash chat, in order to see the differences in generative search for yourself. Both are free to use. As an example, I used the same search that I used before, novels about stone carving. Google Bard recommends a list of books, some with links, but not all of them. Now, Google, just (laughs) as I record this, Google has just released the more powerful Gemini model. So Bard is likely to become something amazing as that is rolled out. It is meant to be similar um, to GPT-4 on many of these things. And it's also free, remember. Uh, So I then tried the same search on Bing Chat, which is based on GPT-4. So uh, Microsoft and OpenAI, which makes uh, ChatGPT, have a business relationship. And so Bing uses GPT-4. Pretty much all of Microsoft is now based on GPT-4. So uh, when I did this search on Bing Chat, there are links. It also did surface a useful site called Working the Flame and their list of best stone carving and sculpting books, which I did click through to. So that was quite good. It did actually provide a link to some more content. What's also interesting with Bing, in similar to if you use ChatGPT, it gives you more it gives you questions that you might want to ask next to delve further into the topic. So it can easily develop into a longer back and forth conversation that shifts as you further personalize it. So I can go from an initial question about books around stone carving to asking it to teach me about carving specific types of stone in lessons and it can even show me you know pictures and that kind of thing. So Google owns YouTube, so it's likely that video search will incorporate aspects of this at some point. And in terms of audio, Spotify works with Google's AI tools as well. In mid-November, The Verge reported that Spotify is using Google Cloud's LLMs, large language models, to analyse the roughly 5 million podcasts and three and a half, no, 350,000 audiobooks in its content library with a goal of trying to augment the data to improve Spotify's personalised recommendations for podcasts and audiobooks. 
Also, as I recorded this, it's a pretty big week. Uh, Find Away Voices, which is owned by Spotify, also just announced they will now accept AI narrated audiobooks by Google Play Books AI narration service, which ties the two companies together even further. So it looks like Spotify is going to work with Google's AI for all of this. Generative search in chat GPT and will Amazon search change in 2024? These previous examples use the free generative AI search engines, but I have found my my search behaviour has shifted to using ChatGPT to help me find things, and I'm using ChatGPT4, the pro version. As I write this in early December 2023, I'm buying books for Christmas, which is basically all I ever give people. (laughs) So I asked ChatGPT4, I want to buy a book for my niece. She is seven. She likes science, unicorns and gymnastics, and she is a good reader. Can you please recommend 10 options? And uh, there's a tip for ChatGPT and many of these LLMs always suggest how many options you would like it to return. And, uh, and it could do 20. It can do whatever you like, basically. It gave me a list of books and a description of each. And interestingly, no links to bookstores, resources or anywhere else. So I could use that list to buy on my favourite online store or order through my local bookshop. My husband Jonathan used ChatGPT this week to find a sleeve case for his laptop, which is noteworthy because Jonathan loves YouTube and normally will spend hours and hours watching all kinds of review videos on all kinds of different things. But this time he just used a refined search on ChatGPT, telling it the size of his, the model of the laptop. And uh, he didn't, he didn't even specify the size. He just said the model and then it went and found things and it basically said what he wanted. So he used this refined search because he didn't want to spend so long watching all the videos and trying to sift out the right information for his particular laptop model and size. Now, of course, ChatGPT can only give him the right answer because of the review videos and articles. At the moment, the people who produce those get an affiliate payment or a percentage of ad commission or product sponsorship, which is why people do video reviews in the first place. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. But what about Amazon? Since that is responsible for the majority of book sales and discovery online, at least in the larger English-speaking markets. Well, this kind of search is exactly what Amazon is currently building, so users can do more nuanced search within the store itself. Back in May 2023, The Verge reported that Amazon is building an AI-powered conversational experience for search. It will help you find answers to product questions, perform product comparisons, receive personalised product suggestions and so much more. There are rumours this is called Project Nile. And Joe Lambagieva outlines what it might mean on AI for e-commerce and Amazon sellers. The Amazon search bar will be enhanced with advanced AI capabilities, offering instant product comparisons, in-depth details, reviews and recommendations based on search context and user shopping data. In the same way as Bard and Bing use fewer links, Amazon will proactively offer diverse options and details without the user having to click on each product individually. Amazon has their own large language models and has also invested in Anthropic, which has the Claude models. Plus, they have all the review data available for books. But of course, these models need feeding. Will we see content creators paid under a data licensing model in future? Because there will certainly need to be some kind of new economy around payment for content. Part 1 how generative search might change book discovery. 1. The text of the book will be used in analysis and discovery. Authors and publishers currently have to tell publishing platforms about the book on upload through a combination of sales description, categories and keywords. Some people write to market by researching these things beforehand but most authors come up with them after writing the book. 
there are tools and services that can help, for example, Publisher Rocket for keywords and Klytics for category research. But for most authors, it's a painful process that few enjoy. I've been, not very patiently, waiting for the day when the platforms themselves can analyse the book and come up with keywords, categories and sales descriptions. After all, they have the text of the book anyway. Now we might be finally getting closer to that happening. Let's take sales descriptions first. For my last two publications, I've used Claude.ai to generate my sales descriptions and use the result with only light editing. You can also do this with ChatGPT4, but I find Claude writes more naturally, although of course the models change every day. I use the paid subscription so I can upload my entire book and then ask it to write a sales description for the book. That's on Claude.ai. I know some people have doubts about uploading work, but I do not, as I shall talk about a bit later. For both Writing the Shadow and Beneath the Zoo, I barely changed a word of what it proposed. So if you backed Writing the Shadow uh, and you basically have read the sales description, that was written by Claude, pretty much entirely. Uh, I obviously edited it a little bit and so did my editor, but very little. It actually did an amazing job. And for Beneath the Zoo, the same thing. I barely changed a word. I think Claude.ai is the best at writing sales descriptions. So Amazon is an investor in Anthropic, which owns Claude, and you can also access it as a service through Amazon Bedrock. So I suspect this is what they're using because in September 2023, Amazon rolled out generative AI to help sellers write product descriptions. And in October 2023, they rolled out AI-powered image generation for marketing products. Now, both of these are for the seller central side of the Amazon store, but how long until this functionality is available for authors as well? This ability to ingest the book and make sense of it will hopefully play a part in discoverability as a more nuanced understanding of the material in the book, including sentiment analysis for the emotional side, which Amazon actually offers as a service using Amazon Comprehend, as well as pure textual analysis should result in users finding the long, long tail of books. 2. Readers will be able to discover cross-genre and niche books more easily. In 2006, Chris Anderson published The Long Tail, Why the Future of Business is Selling Less of More. It was about the slow death of the bestseller model, where everyone was reading, watching and consuming the same things, and the move to a splintering of communities and sub-sub-sub-niches where people could find their particular kind of weird. This splintering is part of why some indie authors can make a living by selling books these days. More authors make more money overall, but those at the top who make the most money sell fewer copies, even if they still take most of the sales. However, the long, long, long tail has still been segmented into clear genres and categories and keywords, once purely related to where books might be shelved in a physical store and now where you might find them on an online store. Email marketing, paid ads and even content marketing have been specifically targeted to easily identifiable groups. Books that fit these niches are easier to market and they sell well, but those that span genres or are more difficult to sell, have struggled to find an audience. When I asked ChatGPT how generative search might help these kinds of books, it provided good news for authors who write cross-genre, or who write books that don't fit into existing categories and keywords. Generative search is akin to a skilled diver who plunges into the depths and brings to the surface hidden treasures, books that might have otherwise remained buried in obscurity. This technology has the unique capability to unearth lesser-known works, giving them the sunlight they deserve. For emerging authors and those writing in niche genres, this is a game-changer, offering visibility in a crowded marketplace. Generative search can also facilitate serendipitous discoveries by connecting readers with books they might not have found through traditional search methods. 
By understanding the nuances of natural language, generative search can identify hidden gems and unexpected connections between books, broadening readers' literary horizons. For example, if a reader searches for books about love, generative search might also recommend books about friendship, family or loss, as these themes are related to different kinds of love. Generative search algorithms can also analyse user behaviour data, including search history, reading habits and online interactions. This allows them to identify patterns and trends in a reader's interests. For example, if a reader has recently read a book about historical fiction, generative search might recommend other books in the same genre, even if the reader has not explicitly searched for them. As an author of cross-genre fiction as J.F. Penn, this encourages me. For years, I found it frustrating to try and fit my books into category and keyword boxes when they span so many different areas. I'm hopeful that the more nuanced generative search might surface my fiction, and maybe yours, in different ways. AI is also increasingly multilingual and getting better and better at translation, with tools like Meta's Seamless, Amazon Translate, Google Translate and DeepL. By understanding the context and intent of multilingual queries, generative search can connect readers with books that resonate with their interests, regardless of the author's native language. Generative search might be able to find books across language barriers that can either be translated with special apps, or they could help translators, authors, publishers and other business partners discover books to bring into new markets. 3. Non-fiction that answers questions may be replaced by generative search. One of the biggest ways that I've changed my behaviour over the last year is using ChatGPT for things that in the past I would have used Google for, or even bought a book on. ChatGPT 4 is now connected to the internet through Bing, and you can also use various custom GPTs to do certain tasks. For example, I asked ChatGPT, I'd like to learn more about making beautiful books. Can you give me a list of topics I could investigate further on this? It gave me a list, including illustration and artwork, typography, bookbinding, paper quality and different types of paper, layout, cultural and historical context and more. Since it saves each conversation, I can now go deeper into each topic, essentially forming a choose-your-own-adventure curriculum that is suited to my specific situation and each question I ask, where I can drill down into things that will help me specifically. In the past, I might have bought a load of books and only used a few chapters of each. In this case, I asked it to expand on paper quality and types of paper, and it went deeper into the types of paper, considerations in choosing paper for a book, the role of paper in book design, sustainability and more. And again, screenshots in the notes. Being a bibliophile, I've used this kind of search to find more books to read, I'll have a conversation and at the end I'll say, can you give me books to read in this area? It will give me a list, I can go and check them out and maybe buy some of them. I used this process for the beautiful books chat and it gave me a list of 10 books and a brief summary of each, including Paper, Paging Through History by Mark Kurlansky and The Paper Maker's Companion, The Ultimate Guide to Making and Using Handmade Paper by Helen Hebert. It did not provide a link to any specific store. I could now go into my preferred store to find those books and type those in or copy and pasted them, and it would look like a direct search on that site rather than a generative search discovery. So almost like the link between the search and the buy is broken. This is now my preferred method to find books. I might say, oh, I really enjoyed this book. Can you recommend 10 books like it? Uh, you know, what I used to use Amazon for. I use it for fiction and non-fiction. This is far more nuanced than the reductive category and keyword approach, and I really much prefer it. I've also used this method for planning research trips to specific locations, as well as for more practical things like cooking times and recipes, fixing household items, and advice on health and financial questions. 
Now ChatGPT is connected to the internet with Bing, it means I can get links if I want to fact check the data or get another point of view. This also works with voice on ChatGPT. So you can basically, I have the app on my phone, I just talk to my phone. And this will soon work on other voice assistants. I've started using that vocal conversational element of ChatGPT more and enjoy going back and forth with it on topics that are useful while I'm busy doing other things. While this can be a way to discover books for those of us who love books and have a budget for them, I would also expect it to reduce the need for the type of articles and books currently used to answer how-to questions. And here is the big thing for me. And I have been looking into this for about a year since ChatGPT came along. And I've kind of hinted at it, but now I am saying it out loud on the podcast. This is one of the reasons I'm not going to do any more how-to books for authors under Joanna Penn. Because you can find really good information that is personalised to your situation by using generative AI tools. Let's take book marketing as a topic. You could buy my book, How to Market a Book, and a host of other books on the topic and figure out a way to apply them all to your situation. Or you could go on Bing or Bard or ChatGPT4 and use a series of questions to work through a marketing plan for your specific book and situation. You can include the whole book as a reference if you like, as well as your skills and experience, and ask for a curriculum to work through as well as ideas for your book. You can also use it to make specific marketing assets for your book, from images using using Dali through ChatGPT, to ad copy, to TikTok or YouTube video scripts, to a press release tailored to a specific publication, or a pitch to be on a podcast for a certain genre. It can do so much for you, you just need to ask. If you're comfortable with uploading your books to the AI tools, which I am, as mentioned earlier, you can upload the book and then ask it to generate you a marketing plan (laughs) before asking for specific tips. I know this is crazy. It's just so good. Can you give me 20 ideas for TikTok videos I can make to help sell this book? Or can you recommend five magazines or blogs or podcasts to pitch for this book or whatever you want to focus on? Just go back and forth in a conversation. This kind of use case for the large language models is fascinating, but it's also why I won't be writing any more how-to non-fiction books. I have, however, fine-tuned a custom GPT so you can use the model based on my books and my perspective. It will even say, hello, creative. (laughs) If you are a pro user of ChatGPT, you can use it at thecreativepen.com forward slash Jobot, J-O-B-O-T, thecreativepen.com forward slash Jobot. So that is ChatGPT4 fine-tuned with my books. You can ask that for a marketing plan. Of course, I still would love you to buy my books. Thank you so much. (laughs) But I wanted to point this out as how this is going to affect book sales. So I will still write nonfiction, but I will make my books much more personal and include elements of memoir and other aspects that make the books more unique and more human. I was initially struggling with this, but now I actually find this freeing as an author and it's helped me move into the more personal books that are more challenging to write, but are also more rewarding as a creator and have touched readers in a significant way. Since the advent of ChatGPT a year ago, I've published Pilgrimage, Lessons Learned from Solo Walking Three Ancient Ways. And although you certainly can use ChatGPT to give you practical advice on walking, it cannot give you the human perspective of walking day after day along sacred paths, or an insight into the mental health challenges of midlife. I also published Writing the Shadow, Turn Your Inner Darkness into Words. And again, although you can ask ChatGPT how to use elements of Carl Jung's shadow in your writing, it cannot give you the personal insights and stories about how I have incorporated aspects of darkness into my books. And I should say neither of those were written, like the words within the book, neither of them were written with AI, but I used it as part of marketing. I'm also focusing on creating beautiful physical products, which hopefully readers will treasure as well as finding the content useful. The special pilgrimage hardback included real photos... (laughs) 
from my walks and my Writing the Shadow special hardback included gold foil and a ribbon. Generative AI cannot create these beautiful books either and I don't think people who generate books are going to create things like this basically. I've started working on a gothic cathedral coffee table book, which will include my own photos as well as personal essays. Again, an incredibly personal book, which will be a beautiful physical object. I will be launching that on Kickstarter towards the end of 2024. I have started that. I have pictures from more than a decade of being obsessed with gothic cathedrals. More to come. If you're writing a non-fiction book or you have a blog that is focused on how-to articles or you're a freelance writer, make sure that everything you write has enough personal elements so it could not be mistaken for something generated by a large language model. Four. Generate-to-market apps may produce books based on search terms. Generative search paired with Generate to Market could deliver books that some readers love. I don't think this is too far off, especially for niche markets where readers know what they like and want that same experience over and over again. As an example, consider Werewolf Shifter Romance. A Generate to Market app could ask a series of follow-up questions. Do you want MM or Sapphic or Reverse Harem or Bully Romance? Do you want this set in London or Rome or in Off Planet, Outer Space or whatever else might spin this into a more specific story? Once the reader has answered a series of questions, the app could generate, let's say, six covers for the book. The user clicks on the one they like. The book is generated, sent to their device or to a print on demand service. With AI narrated audio going mainstream, this could also be an instant audiobook. With the quality of AI generated text improving every month, and the ability to generate a complete book cover almost available, as well as the rise of custom GPTs and agent AIs, I think this type of app could be possible even in the next year. This type of book will satisfy a certain kind of reader in specific genres where people know exactly what they want but it won't account for the cross-genre books, those written from personal experience, or those where readers connect in some way with the author. If you write to market in genres where this might happen in the years ahead, even if you think it's years off, then consider how you can stand out if this kind of app does become a possibility. 5. Advertising will become more granular and managed at scale by AI. Paid ads are an important aspect of book marketing, but many authors have found that costs are now too high for a decent return on investment, particularly in popular genres, high-selling keywords, or for standalone books that don't fit within a series. Generative AI will not get rid of ads, mainly because some of the biggest companies make so much revenue from them. But it's likely they will be incorporated in a different way. Here are some of the ways that ChatGPT suggested paid ads might change. A. Personalisation at scale. Generative search algorithms excel in understanding user preferences and context, allowing for highly personalised advertising. Advertisers can leverage this to create more targeted campaigns that resonate with individual users, potentially increasing engagement and conversion rates. Instead of bidding on fixed keywords, advertisers might need to consider a broader range of factors, such as user intent, search context and behavioural patterns, for their ads to be effectively positioned. So that's what ChatGPT said. From an author perspective, this should further splinter target audiences. At the moment, ads are expensive for popular keywords and keyword phrases, and potentially this change might result in many more potential keyword conversations, which is what I'm calling it, a keyword conversation, which hopefully might make it cheaper to win a bid. 
You can delve deeper into how this might work through Google's video on Search Generative Experience, SGE, which demonstrates demonstrates the change. It's a really good video. Definitely watch it if you are at all interested in advertising. Let's take my gift book search example from earlier. I want to buy a book for my niece. She is seven, likes science, unicorns and gymnastics, and she's a good reader. Can you recommend 10 books? In the current system of keyword ads, this might relate to books for girls age seven or unicorn books for kids. But in future, the keyword conversation might emerge as something like books for girls age seven to nine years old, plus science, plus unicorns, plus gymnastics. And then the conversation might go further, like, is it her birthday? Is this a Christmas gift? Does she have pets? Or other questions that will make the search even more specific. Search Engine Land suggests that trust and authority in source sites matters even more than ever and that Google's search algorithm values EEAT signals, experience, expertise, authoritativeness and trustworthiness. Optimising for long-tail queries will become more important and although there will be more of them, the conversion rate should be higher for each as someone is more likely to find the exact answer to their question this way. The same principles would likely apply with Amazon ads. Currently, we use basic keywords and keyword phrases, but a conversational AI assistant would take a customer down a more specific path. So we are likely to bid on far more granular keywords in the generative search model. Two, dynamic ad content creation, targeting and management. With generative AI, the creation of ad content could become more dynamic and responsive. Ads could be generated by AI services in real time, tailored to the specific context of the search, the user's profile, or even current trends, making them more relevant and effective. I am already using AI-powered images and AI targeting with meta-ads in a conversion campaign to my Shopify store, jfpenbooks.com. This is currently being run as part of a testing phase by Matthew Holmes, who will be coming on the Creative Pen podcast in early 2024 to talk about our results. Our process has been to upload the book to Claude.ai and have it come up with ideas for images for Facebook ads, as well as specific prompts, and then create those images on Midjourney. It's possible now because Dali is incorporated into ChatGPT that we could just do that directly on chat. But when we started this a couple of months ago, uh, Claude.ai was still better. So you can experiment. We use conversion ads to my Shopify store with only country in terms of targeting and the meta AI algorithm handles the rest. It combines the various images and headlines and text to find the best combination for people who will click through and buy based on conversion to sale. I'm selling far more effectively than I have been able to do with specific keywords on Amazon because Meta has so many more data points to find readers, especially when it can optimise for a sale rather than a click. These types of conversion ads are only possible when you have control of the store Hence, we are only running these to Shopify. You can certainly try it with link click ads, but you don't know which of the people who click actually buy, so they are unlikely to optimise so well. Mark Zuckerberg discussed this in an interview with Lex Fridman in June 2023. He said, In the future, if you're advertising on our services, do you need an ad creative? No, you just need to tell us. OK, I'm a dog walker. I'm willing to walk people's dogs. Help me find the right people. We'll create the ad unit that will perform the best. Give an objective to the system and it connects you to the right people. Amazon ads also offer auto ads, which I use for my Amazon advertising. I previously used someone to manually target my ads, but now I just leave it up to the algorithm. I expect this kind of auto-targeting as well as auto-ad creation to become part of the Amazon advertising suite of tools in the same way it's being rolled out by Meta. C. New tools and services will emerge. 
Site-specific auto ads may account for a good chunk of advertising, but I would expect that new tools and services will also emerge. Text-to-video tools are rapidly improving. Check out Runway ML and Pika Labs in particular. Tools like this should make it easier and cheaper to create multimedia ads for our books, as well as adaptations for different media, and perhaps even the resurrection of book trailers that many of us tried unsuccessfully back in the early days. I would love a cross-service book marketing tool that I could upload the book to, and then it would decide which service was best. For example, a Google ad would work well for this, or a Pinterest ad, or an Amazon ad, or a TikTok video, or whatever. It would generate creative for that specific site and run ads, tweaking based on conversion and optimization based on budget and time frame. This may be accomplished by custom GPTs or other agent AIs or other specialized services that put a skin over the base LLMs. Another development that may happen over the next few years might include new ad formats that will open up through augmented reality and virtual reality, which some call the metaverse. I saw Meta's Ray-Ban smart glasses in an optician's on my local high street this week. An Apple's Vision Pro headset looks amazing, although still too expensive for most people. Ads within games and other visual media have been common for bigger brands for years, but perhaps with generative AI, it will become more accessible for authors to place books within these mediums. Part 2. What can authors and publishers do to maximise potential book discovery? 1. Make sure your books are discoverable. Legal cases are in session in various jurisdictions over whether it's fair use for LLM companies to train models on the internet as well as copyrighted works. Those cases will likely go on for years, but in the meantime, development in generative AI continues apace. The biggest companies are embracing it, and you can bet that Microsoft, Google, Amazon and other companies have their best lawyers all over this – and their LLMs are not going anywhere. In my 2020 book, Artificial Intelligence, Blockchain and Virtual Worlds, I suggested that creative works in copyright should be licensed for machine learning, and the original creators compensated with either a one-off license fee or a micropayment facilitated by blockchain smart contracts. This has yet to come to pass but I continue to hope that creators will be able to license data in the future. It might not apply to the original base model training, but it could be a way to monetize more specific content in the future. In the meantime, you can choose to rage against the situation and opt out entirely by using norobots.txt on your websites and including no data scraping or other terminology into your copyright page. Or, you can accept what's happening and play the new game, while still advocating for a new licensing structure when that option becomes available. And of course, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> After all, the same generative AI systems that generate text and other media also drive search, recommend and increasingly sell books for us. If you prevent the generative search engines crawling your book or your site, you will be invisible in this new age of AI. Just like people who block Google aren't visible in Google search. Personally, I want the AI tools to know about my work so they can learn about me and recommend my books to people using nuanced search tools over time. The publishing sites already have the texts of my books, and I have also uploaded my books to ChatGPT and Claude, made by Anthropic, in which Amazon is an investor. I've spent time learning how LLMs work, so I'm not worried about the text of my work being used for training, or I know, and I know, they won't be outputted in an exact replica of my book anywhere else. Existing copyright law protects my intellectual property in terms of the output anyway. 
If you include no data scraping or no AI usage in your books and your website, consider how that might impact things when generative search becomes more mainstream. Two, consider how LLMs get their data and make sure it's up to date. Most of what we already do for marketing will help train the models because they are built from data on the internet. I asked ChatGPT, can you tell me about Stone of Fire by JF Penn and link to sources for your results? It used Bing to search and link to the book page on my own website, jfpen.com, as well as my Shopify store, jfpenbooks.com, and also the Goodreads book page, and Goodreads is owned by Amazon. I went further and asked it for 10 references. It linked to Amazon, Kobo, Bookmate and Barnes & Noble. Again, all book pages I upload information to as part of publishing and all content pages on established sites. There were no social media links at all. Authors and publishers should already be making sure that the book pages on the main sites are up to date and populated with sales descriptions – and potentially add more useful information about the book. ChatGPT suggests, use relevant and engaging keywords in your book titles, descriptions and metadata to accurately represent the core themes and content of your work. This will help generative algorithms identify your book as a relevant match for user queries. It also suggested, engage with readers through questions and answers. Participate in Q&A forums, interviews or AMA, Ask Me Anything sessions. Generative search algorithms often crawl these platforms for detailed insights and direct author engagement. I'm intending to create specific content on my website book pages that may help the model understand more about my books. For example, around themes and settings, character bios and plot elements for my fiction. I have pretty much ignored Goodreads for years, but I might revisit it and see how I can make the data more useful there too. I already list a table of contents on my non-fiction book pages, but I might go further and add more details on book pages about target readers or other more granular information. Most authors already encourage readers to leave reviews, and this will continue to be important. ChatGPT said, Encourage readers to leave reviews of your books on popular book review sites like Goodreads and Amazon. Po positive reviews can boost your book's visibility and credibility, making it more likely to be surfaced by generative algorithms. I asked ChatGPT and Google Bard how to help generative search engines find more useful information, and they both mentioned the importance of featured snippets, which specifically address certain questions and provide answers in a more granular manner. As Bard said, make sure your product pages address the questions that users are likely to ask about your products. There are featured snippet plugins for websites and online stores, so have a look at those if this is something you want to focus on. But as the sophistication of LLMs grow, it's likely that the main way a book will be surfaced is through what the AI can glean about it through the book itself, as well as reviews which contain both factual and emotional reactions to the content. ChatGPT also mentioned the importance of author networks in terms of how book data is related to other books and how authors are connected to other authors in terms of shared interests, genre and style. It also mentioned shared readership identified through keywords as well as professional organisations, conferences, online communities, cross-promotional articles, competitions and style gleaned from reviews. It noted, Generative AI algorithms can use author networks to identify books that are similar to other books that a reader has enjoyed. For example, if a reader has read several books by Jane Austen, a generative AI algorithm might recommend other books in the Regency-era fiction genre, even if the reader has not explicitly searched for them. Author networks can also be used to identify new and upcoming authors who are similar to established authors. For example, a generative AI algorithm might recommend a debut novel by an author who is influenced by J.R.R. Tolkien, even if the reader has not heard of the author before. And I know lots of fantasy authors will be really pleased about that. <laughs> 
Three, connect with readers on a more personal level. Search is only one way that readers find books, and it's about finding new readers who have never heard of you before, or maybe people who've heard of you before but haven't really engaged. Paid ads can amplify this reach, but once again, they're based on finding new readers. If authors want to make a living with their books for the long term, the focus needs to be on nurturing a community of readers who care about the creator, who want to buy from them directly, and are happy to spend on higher quality and higher priced products and services. Those readers are happy to hear from the creator by email or through social feeds or through their podcast or blog. And book sales in this fashion bypass the need for discovery through search or paid ads. This is the thousand true fans model suggested by Kevin Kelly in 2006, and which is truer now than ever before. The trick is the balance of finding new readers as well as nurturing an existing audience, but this has always been a challenge for any author. One of my recommendations is to double down on being human. And I recently made a video on five ways to stand out in an age of AI. It includes showing your face and/or using your voice in marketing, being more personal in your emails and with your community, making beautiful books and physical products, connecting in person, yes, with real people at live events and conferences, and tapping into your shadow side to make your books truly unique, and writing the books only you can write. We can also collaborate with other human authors as part of co-writing or co-promotion, recommend the books we love as readers, and concentrate on the human aspects of being a writer, rather than obsessing about gaming whatever new algorithm comes along next. Conclusion: Change is coming, and the widespread adoption of generative search will be driven by the timelines of the biggest services we use for book discovery. ChatGPT incorporates Bing already, so you may already be using aspects of it. Microsoft products also incorporate ChatGPT as a co-pilot, so again, you might already be using it in some way. While Google Bard is currently lesser known, Google's newly released Gemini model is said to be similar to GPT-4, and it's free to use in Google Bard. It's possible that they will start using it as part of Google.com. As Microsoft is using Chat as part of Bing, and in other Google products like YouTube, Amazon has always excelled at split testing new functions, and it's likely they will slowly roll out generative search to various segments of users. In October 2023, Search Engine Land reported that the retail giant is set to roll out upgraded generative AI capabilities that offer a more conversational, detailed, and personalized user experience in the U.S. from January. That's January 2024. They expect it to help improve the user experience, helping shoppers to find the products they're looking for more easily by providing search results, expert answers, and product suggestions. The company is hoping this will lead to more sales and a higher ROI return on investment, particularly on mobile. Since Amazon has recently released Q, a generative AI chatbot for AWS Amazon Web Services, which is also available for licensing for other companies, they clearly have a model for what could be rolled out elsewhere. As ever, change is the only constant. I asked ChatGPT whether generative AI search was a good thing for authors. It said, "For authors, this technology is a double-edged sword. On one edge, it promises unparalleled visibility, cutting through the dense jungle of digital content to showcase their work to those who are most likely to appreciate it. On the other, it represents a challenge: to remain relevant and visible in a sea where currents are directed by algorithms and trends." We can't know exactly how these shifts will affect us over the next decade, but overall, as ever, I'm positive about the impact these changes will have on authors and the publishing industry. I'm particularly excited about the prospect of generative search surfacing cross-genre books from the long, long, long tail of content. 
I'm also interested in automating far more granular advertising with AI tools that can use many data points to identify readers, as opposed to the blunt instruments of categories and keywords we use today. But I am not planning on chasing any specific algorithmic change. I'm focusing on writing the books that only I can write, while still using the tools as an AI-assisted artisan author, as well as reaching readers directly and nurturing my existing audience. This is an emerging area, so I certainly don't have all the answers, but together we can surf this wave of change rather than drown in it. I'd love to know what you think. How do you think generative search will impact authors and the publishing industry? And I would really appreciate it if you would check all the links in the show notes if you have any thoughts, because I've done extensive research for this article and much of my evidence for this is linked in the show notes at thecreativepen.com. What will you be doing to ensure your books are found And when do you think these changes will start to affect things? Please leave a comment on the show notes or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com, with your thoughts. So I hope you found this episode interesting and I would love to know what you think. I know I'm usually early with things, but it seems like this might be changing things sooner rather than later, which is why I wanted to get it out. So you can leave a message on the show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. If you're inside the Patreon community, I have a video coming soon on how I used various AI tools for my short story, Beneath the Zoo, as well as the monthly audio Q&A. You can join and access everything at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. So next week, I have another solo show (laughs) on my 15 year pivot. I started here in December 2008. So we are at 15 years. And I talked a little bit about some of the changes in the episode earlier, but I will be rounding it all out, setting out my new direction, talking about the different ways I'm going to do my different brands. But don't worry, the podcast continues. So in the meantime, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.